Reading from Cambridge, and uh, she'll talk about a family of monotone Lagrangians. Great, thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation. Um, where's the? Here we go. So, my goal uh, for the afternoon is sort of twofold. Uh, on the one hand, sort of present a sort of family of tools for constructing sort of various flavors of families of monotone Lagrangians, and on the other hand, some tools for telling them apart. Um, but the main thing I want to try to convince you of is that this is quite a sort of flexible, not in any technical sense, toolkit and sort of uh, encourage other people to uh, use it. So uh, I'm going to be thinking about Lagrangians in um, also, my shoulder is quite tight, and this is, this is already a stretch, so apologies, I'm not going to be using anywhere near this board, although, to be honest, this was probably designed for a man. Um, so, xp plus yq plus z to the r. Um, so, and so this is an affine variety and it, there might be more dimensions. So these are, these are uh, Briscoe Fum. Varieties. So this, if I think of this as a symplectic manifold, I can deform by some morsification on the first two coordinates and keep z to the r for the right. And this, now just by projecting to the z coordinate, allows me to describe this space as a total space of a left shift vibration that's going to be the sort of core for a lot of these constructions. So the left shift vibration. So what does this look like? Well, I'm going to have Z clusters of P minus 1 times Q minus 1 critical points. So sorry, R clusters. Um, so a different way of thinking of that is that there's a Z mod R symmetry, cyclic symmetry. So here's another one. Here's the next one. Um, where P minus 1 times Q minus 1 is the number of critical points of the function f. Okay, so before I go any further, are there questions about this? Speak up. Yes, so this is my space, this affine variety, so equal to 1. And I map down by projecting to the z coordinate to c. Yeah. This is the total space. This is the base. Any other questions? Yeah, so it's a morsification of xp plus yq. Come again? Sure, sure. So. Sorry, I, 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 I
Um, that doesn't quite do it, right? Because, I mean, you, maybe a better way to think about it, it would just be if you took generic polynomials of degree P in X and Q in Y. Um, although you could have mixed terms if that suited you. Yeah. So, so the most, uh, so a fairly basic example, and you can just focus on this one if this is not so familiar, is when you, if you have P is three and Q is two, and now, the fiber of this projection is just a once punctured, a twice punctured genus one curve. So this is the fiber. And there are three critical points. Uh, sorry, I said that and I want four here. Now there are three. Say so this one. Ah, this is the blue that isn't really blue. There are two blues here I learned last week. There's light blue and blue. Light blue is kind of like white. So let me try again. Okay. So dark blue has the disadvantage of being kind of like green, but is this more visible than before? Thanks, Joe. So let me call this one A. This one B. And this one C. And in this case, these are the three, so in this case, P minus one, Q minus one is just three. So, and then this pattern would repeat. Etc. Um, so, because this is a symplectic geometry conference, I assumed everyone knew what a Lefschetz vibration was, but perhaps that was a mistake. Um, so, if someone, so this is the fiber over the critical the zero. Um, so, does everyone understand what this space is? Yankee. So, uh, yeah. The thing I had in my head didn't, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I think, yeah, because when you differentiate, you get one and then you get the roots of unity. But then, then, then they're not gonna be lined <coughs> up nicely like I have them here. What's that? Like if I had written that down, someone would object that they're not lined up nicely the way I have them here. That happened to me last time. So what I'm saying here is just PQR greater or equal to one. Of course, if any is equal to one, then this is C3, right? Uh, two. You just believe everything I tell you.
Okay, so there are two different flavors of tools that is my main goal to communicate for you today. The first is constructing these Lagrangians, and the second is a family of simplex morphisms of these spaces. So, two ideas today. Some um, Lagrangian constructions in, we call it XPQ. And two is um, new perspective, let me say, because it's a symplectomorphism when you're ready, on a symplectomorphism of XPQ. Um, and this will, if we have time more, if you want to talk to me afterwards, help us sort of bootstrap our Lagrangians to get to higher dimensions. Okay, so this is gonna be the main focus. Ah, what well is the first one? So, there's, let me, s suppose I start with, I'm in the base Call this my pi. I'm in the base of pi. I have some smooth point and I'll assume that my fiber is just the elliptic curve. And suppose I start with my curve B. And say I'm keeping track of an orientation on B. And now I know I have all these critical points. So I could imagine you know, starting with a smooth thing and kind of weaving around them and looking at the monodromy. So let me do that with an A then a B, then a C, and then an A again. So, um, Luis, I'm sorry. Um, if you can't tell the colors apart, here is an A, a B, a C, and an A again. What? <laughs> How did you guess? So, so what am I doing? I start with this curve, then if I were to go here, and now I'm comparing down this way, what have I done? I've done a positive Dane twist in A. I'm not gonna draw that. Then I Dane twist in B, then in C, and then back in A, and it's a good exercise to calculate what the effect of the monodromy is, and you'll see, <coughs> that it brings you over to C, and I'm gonna keep track of the orientation on that curve. So I'm gonna call this thing as sort of a block BC. Now, if I put in a second BC block,
and I also went over that, then you could check that you start with C, and then you do the same process in reverse, but that brings you back to B. So the net effect is that this closes up to a torus. So what have I done? I've constructed, what have I done? I've constructed a Lagrangian torus, which is an S1 in my fiber, although that S1 kind of changes, as it were, as I go along, but it's an S1 in the fiber times this S1 in the base. Okay, so that's the start. Um, I'm going to redraw the same picture just with BCs in. Now, suppose I'm starting here again, still with the same guy. Um, and I come over here. But now notice in, but this, this is both, like, the reason I'm drawing these is because I'm comparing them down to the origin like this, right? But now, in the fiber, these two vanishing cycles don't intersect. So to close up, I could do this instead. And this would be immersed immersed in the base, but embedded in the total space. Okay, so in a sense, this is the most, well, one of the most important ideas in the talk, which is that where we can use Basically, by using mapping class relation type considerations, we, we can start looking at Lagrangians fibered over way more complicated things. Um, um, so this is a torus because it was this way, then this way, and then it goes back. So it keeps, it's always pointing the same side. So that's a torus. But that's a great question because there's another relation that's going to be very helpful, which is I could start with the same thing. And do A, B, and then B again, and then A. And then if you calculate what the effect of that is, it brings you back to B, but with the opposite orientation. So this I could close up, but to a Klein bottle. wish I hadn't put these in red because it's the same thing that carries around. Maybe I should have used the third color. I I'd planned on doing that and I completely forgot.
Um, other questions about this? So now that I've got these sort of basic tricks, I can run with them. So So for instance, let me say I'm starting with a B curve, and I go to a BC block, and I go over this, and it's a C curve. Now say I wrap around again. Well, this would be back to a B curve. That's not good, because then I'd come in here and intersect. Well, let me put a BC block. And then I get to C, so I can wrap. And then a B, and then C again. And now you can see you can wrap for all eternity. And so I get a C curve. And this is all going to be enclosing some kind of positive area, so maybe it would be helpful to have stuff the other side like this. So, um, and let me just do a symmetric thing. Etc. So the title the title of my talk has the word monotone in it. And I haven't told you anything about monotonicity. In fact, I haven't even told you about Maslow indices. Um, so the next thing is that it's sort of essentially formulaic for these kind of construction. The, there's a formula for these kind of for the Maslow index for these kind of constructions. So Maslow index. So in, in this case, you can calculate that. So first of all, let me say that the meridian-like curve has Maslow index 0. Um, and there's nothing deep to that. It, it's a vanishing cycle in this picture. So it bounds a Lagrangian disk. Um, this curve here in the base, you can calculate has Maslow index zero, um, just by sort of playing around by hand with this configuration, um, with, with this orientation. This one here, you can check has Maslow index one. Um, and this tells you what the, so, so in this configuration, I didn't put in any, uh, let me call this BB. Um, in this configuration, I didn't put in, I just put in BCs, um, but I could also add some BBs or BCs, right? Or CCs. So, so if this was just a true vibration, if I didn't have any critical points, and I was just taking some cycle in the fiber and spinning it around, that would have mass loss index two because it would be from the winding number in the base. And similarly here, it would also be true. So what this is telling you is the Maslow index of the longitude, as it were, by which I mean the lift of the curve in the base, this is, um, well, the thing you'd expect if you didn't have the mapping classes, so twice the winding number of the S1, of the MSS1, 
um, minus the signed number of times you go through one of these configurations. The BC, BB, or CC configuration is traversed. Um, so, okay. So how, so now if I want, well so far I've just given you Tora and Klein bottles. If I want, say I want to prescribe a uh, monotonicity constant. Notice that this part is enclosing something of positive area, this part is enclosing something of negative area. As long, well in this case, as long as I make the two lobes symmetric, I'd enclose an area zero. And this has obviously has mass off index zero because of symmetry, or because of that formula. So adjust areas of lobes for exactness. Um, and here, similarly, I made sure to have a bit that was winding one way and a bit that was winding the other way, but now I can always adjust the areas of the lobes to get any monotonicity constant I want. So adjust areas of lobes to get desired kappa monotonicity constant. Yes. Mm. I have two BCs. I have a BC here, and I put in a second BC. I put, I put in the second BC to be to be able to have a torus. That's a great question, because yeah. So you so normally you'd have a two, right? And it's adjusted by minus one, minus one. Um, and of course, this sort of zeroth example doesn't have a chance of being exact because it encloses a thing of positive area. Uh, and in fact, you can deform it to be, some, to be exact, but not remaining fibered in this way. Um, other questions? Cool. So, um, Genus. Well, I can get higher genus, or in fact, connect sums of arbitrarily many Tori and Klein bottles just by using, by taking a bunch of different copies of these and then doing Porterovich connect sums. So you could imagine putting yourself in a configuration where just before here you had, say, a BB and then having a matching cycle come out of that. I'm going to put some color in. And then you could do, say the matching cycle goes to another one, and you could do Poltorovich connect sum to get something genus two. Um, higher genus or connect sums of Klein bottles or hybrids, um, Paul Torevich connects sum uh, I guess I'm using this connect sum symbol um, with a matching cycle. Or matching cycles if you want high genus in general. Um, are there questions about anything I've done so far? Yeah, Yankee. Yeah. So, so all that you need in order to do this is an A3 chain. So everything I've done so far, you just need an A3 chain, right? And so as long as 
either this is either you, if, if you have either f at least four and two or at least three and three, you're going to have an A3 chain. So in the smaller, smallest cases, you can't make any. You basically can't make anything, but you knew that for topological reasons. So here. What do you mean? Um, no, so, so it depends on exactly, I mean, I'm just, I'm just giving you a collection of examples, right? So it would depend on exactly what that works means. But I think, I mean, for this one, if I'm ignoring this, I am using four of these configurations, and I think you would need R is at least 14, <coughs> but I would have to check. Um, but then, but then you can wind. But then the the theorems that I'll state in just a second, where you have like family of infinitely with blah, they're all in for a fixed R because you use the fact that then you can wind at nauseum without changing R. Yeah, I sorry, I didn't want to assume myself away from the lowest number cases right off the bat because depending on what you care about, you can like write those numbers down and sort of reproduce like tori that Renato or I have thought about in different ways or what are probably the same tori. So it's worth signaling those as well. At least that's what I think. Um, cool. So So consequences or our applications. So first of all is if you fix G um, and a monotonicity constant kappa and the Maslow class then you can get infinitely many Monotone Lagrangians sigma G um, with the prescribed this prescribed data um, up to, for instance, Hamiltonian isotopy. Um, for instance, by, uh, f I should say, for all sufficiently large R, for, let me say, either PQ more than 4, 3, 4, 2, 3, 3, and all sufficiently large R. Um, where here I did the thing that we tell our undergraduate students never to do. Um, and the proof could be, for instance, just taking uh, the flow homology with some fixed, like, oh, and I should say in the same homology class. So they're not, like, every, all, all topological data about them is the same. Uh, and the proof would be just to write down one of these constructions and take flow homology with, like, for instance, some fixed matching cycle. So e.g. use flow homology with a fixed comparison Lagrangian. Okay. 
So the things get more interesting, or at least in my opinion, if you look, for instance, at flower homology of these guys with themselves, like within a fixed family. Um, and so, so again, so same hypothesis on P and Q and R. Then you can have, uh, I'm going to state it for tori, but it would also be true for higher genus. You can have an infinite family of monotone tori, for instance, of exact tori, where the Fleur cohomology groups between them could be, well, it's going to be even, but it's going to be given by some collection of, well, they're going to intersect in some collection of S2s, of, of S1s. And you can just arrange Maslow indices so that there's no cancellations in the differential. And so then you get a family of tori where the rank of the Fleur group between them, at least for, f for certain local systems, Yankees figured out their punchline already, cool, um, is, well, it can be, if with some local systems, it's going to be zero. But you can, it can also be arbitrary of rank two, like zero, two, four, et cetera. Um, which, from the perspective of mirror symmetry, is kind of interesting. So, get a family of monotone tori, say Tn, such that for uh, uh, distinguished local systems say nebula n hf of T naught um, so Z would be or rather the rank would be two N. Um, similarly for higher genus. Um, so note, this is going to include some exact tori. Uh, so we're used to the paradigm in sort of closely related examples. So we, we understand quite a lot about mirror symmetry for these Bruce confirm guys because they're weighted homogeneous singularities. But we're used to this paradigm whereby exact tori should be mirrored to C star square charts. And either this flow homology between a torus and other torus is going to be the same because they correspond to the same point with different local systems, or they're zero because they correspond to two, two other points. And then, you know, the skyscraper shoes of these points don't talk. Um, but here, this is obviously not the case. So it's not, you know, even though we know what the mirrors to these spaces are, or at least we have some descriptions of the mirrors. It's not clear what these tori should be mirrored to, but there's, some, there's clearly something interesting going on just because of the flare theory. And also, there's just lots of different ways of making tori using these kind of constructions. Um, so that is a second application. Um, let me erase this, but I want to keep my picture, so maybe I'll just erase here. So, uh, third thing, which is going to be just for tori, is that I can tell the tori apart up to 
compactly supported symplectomorphism as opposed to Hamilton. So, so far I was telling things apart by comparing with the HF with a test Lagrangian, but that gives you an invariant up to Hamiltonian isotopy. In particular, you might be like, well, what if all of these tori are secretly the same because you, there's like clearly tons of spheres in this picture, maybe you can just do a bunch of the twists. Um, well, in fact, they, that's not possible because you can use holomorphic annuli counts to tell uh, monotone tori apart. So, the sketch idea is, suppose you start with a given torus, fire it over this, um, so this guy is T, then I can pick a small displacement in the monotone direction, and we're going to call that T prime. I look above, for instance, haha. -ha. I'm sorry, I came up with all of these cunning plans for colors ahead of time, and now I've got carried away and forgotten all of them. I wanted this guy to be a different color as well. How are you doing, Luis? Okay, thank you. So, above this intersection point, remember this is the one where you have a B in one direction and a C in another one. So, now that I've taken the guy in this push off, um, One of them lies, for instance, on this side, and the other one lies on that side. But now I can take a partial, but now you could imagine sort of partially compactifying so that you compactify the fibers. And now you see that I have a holomorphic annulus here. Um, and I'm not going to say very much about them because I could give a whole lecture just about things you can do with holomorphic annuli. Um, but I just want to advertise the fact that in this particular, for this kind of example, um, these give a well-defined invariant. Um, there are lots of more complicated examples where there are holomorphic annuli and one would hope that they give invariance, but the sort of analytical work to be done to prove that, uh, which I haven't done, but um, I think I want to advertise the existence already of these ones as sort of encouragement for everyone to think more about holomorphic annuli. Um, so this, these two are Maslow index zero, so this is a, um, Maslow zero annulus, and so the expected dimension is zero. Um, so it's obviously the one in the fiber is regular, and in the base they intersect transversely, so that's also regular. Um, and you'd have to worry about, we have to worry about bubbling, except you don't because they're monotone. You have to worry about the boundary where they meet, as sort of the half moon thing, but they don't because T and T prime are disjoint. And then you have to worry about a boundary bit contracting, but you don't because this curve is non-contractible in T. So this was an, a specialist explanation of why the analysis works in this case. So if you didn't follow that, don't worry. 
ask me afterwards if you're interested. Well, you're not because you've, I've partially compactified, so they're no longer monotone. But the, you'd have two kinds of bubbles. But the bubbles, the bubbles that lie, the, the bubbles. This is self intersection. This is intersection one, the annulus and the sort of uh, divisor at infinity. So if a bubble doesn't touch the divisor at infinity, then it's back in the monotone guy, and you 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 rule it out. Speak up. But, but T prime is defined purely in terms of T. It's just a small displacement of T in the monotone direction. That's an intrinsic thing in terms of T. Um, so so think, think, of your, think of your Maslow class as giving you a map from the torus to S1 without critical points. And then you can get between any two such maps smoothly without. But like then they become like there's a uh, differential topology question about just maps to, from Tori to S1 that don't have critical points. So any two such displacements would be symplectically isotopic without going through stuff that intersects. I'm confused that it thinks it's kind of well, it's not. I mean, I could make these two guys a bit closer, but people at the back might not be impressed. I mean, they might not be impressed anyway. Are there other questions? So the fourth thing that so so I'm sort of giving you just lots of flavors of applications. Uh, so the fourth application is upgrade to C3. So I can think I can think about the map from C3 to C given by I think we call it f of xy plus z to the r. So that's going to have a bunch of critical points. And now I could just say, well, here's x, p, q, r just hanging out. I could pick a Lagrangian in here. And then I can just spin it around. Um, and I could pick this area. So say this guy was monotone. Pick areas so that this is monotone. After all, there's finitely many critical points, so I have all the area in the world to do that. Um, so this means that I get Lagrangians in C3. Um, so I get a monotone, say, S1 times G in S ah, C3. Um, the Maslow index uh, with respect to uh, so the obvious basis where for sigma G oh, I really I'm going to try on the other hand. So remember, my guys were made by connecting things together. Um, and I can think of having you know, meridian and longitude, meridian and longitude, as I had before. So or rather, longitude meridian. So the Maslow index is going to be 2 for the S1. And then I can have anything I want for the longitude. So 2, say 2, well, it has to be so 
where ni in z is arbitrary, um, and now it turns out that Uh, so using, so for g greater or equal to 2, um, using three manifold theory, um, say n, which is the g, or yeah, gcd of the ni, is an invariant. So the GCD of the NI is certainly an invariant of just the Lagrangian of genus G inside XPQR, right? But the point is that three-manifold theory tells you that as long as G is two or more, the splitting of a three-manifold as S1 times the surface of genus G is essentially unique. So this is going to be an invariant, which in particular means that just for um, reasons of sort of symplectic topological data, mainly the Maslow index, I get infinitely many uh, in C3. So get infinitely many monotone S1 sigma g in C3 um, up to, well, anything that would preserve the Maslow index. So it can be weak, weaker even than the symplectomorphism. Like it could be a, uh, almost, uh, if you were an almost complex map, you'd preserve the Maslow index. So up to eg some particular with scalings or whatever, almost complex maps. Um, just, just by telling them apart, actually, by the Maslow index. Um, uh, uh, telling them apart. Or distinct, that's what I was saying. Distinguished. by their Maslow index. Um, and there's a remark. You might, the, for those of you who are wondering how this fits with previous work, uh, this is g greater or equal to 2. So we knew that this was needed in the monotone case by work of Evans and Kedra. And using uh, holomorphic disks, Denis had already studied, and I think better studied, the case of Tori. Um, and of course, it would be very interesting to try and get, so the question really is, let's try and get infinitely many for a fixed bit of data like this. And for that, there are sort of candidates using holomorphic annuli, but uh, then you get interesting analysis problems. Um, so, so I can't solve the analysis in that case, but what I then did is I constructed variations on this in, so would like uh, to tell them apart for fixed 
topological data using holomorphic candy line. Um, and this is the fifth brief thing, which is that in, say, X, P, Q, R, S, um, construct variations on the S1 times genus G um, such that the analytical difficulties are ruled out. Um, so these are perhaps, well, to me, they're interesting in the very own right because sort of, <coughs> sort of mirror symmetric reasons, but the other thing is a sort of proof of concept that you might expect something interesting for the C3 keys as well. Um, the um, thing I want to end on very briefly uh, and ask me about it if you have questions, is there a key for this which is the second idea I'd, say I'd mention, is that if I go back to my symmetric picture for XP plus Y, for XPQR, so I have P minus one times Q minus one, So assume that C, sorry, R, is K times the LCM of P and Q. Then there exists a symplectomorphism of XPQR Perfectly supported uh, given by on the sort of picking up the base, so sort of a generalization of a Dane twist. So you you rotate the base by a certain amount so that the vanishing cycles go to similar vanishing cycles. Compactly supported. Um, which which corresponds to, um, let me just say, rotating the base by plus two pi over k. Um, and it's Hamiltonian isotopic to the monodromy of the singularity. to the power LCM of PQ. Um, so I know I haven't given details for this, but I wanted to advertise it if you're thinking about these spaces, that a priori, if you've thought about this kind of stuff before, a priori this monogamy, well, it's a composition of lots of Dane twists. So if you're in the leftist vibration business, you're like, well, I need to do this Dane twist and then that Dane twist and that Dane twist. And it turns out that in this setting, there's a completely rotationally invariant, much prettier way of describing this, and they're isotopic. But using that sort of cleaner description allows you to sort of have more tools at your fingertips. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>